Hey, this is Al McGee with your entertainment ticket at www.yeticket.com. I'm speaking to film director Melissa Hazlip, and we're going to talk about her movie, Mr. Soul. First question about Mr. Soul, it's about Ellis Hazlip. Is this your uncle? Is it your cousin? Who is he to you? Yeah, thank you for having me. This is a film about Ellis Hazlip who actually was my uncle and I was okay. very close to him. He was my mentor and he was also an incredible producer and a change maker, a trailblazer, really. Of course, he's my uncle first, but this story is about music and culture and, you know, it's really a love letter to black culture. So I'm so happy to be telling this story. Oh this yeah, program. and I'm so glad that I got an opportunity to see this story because I'm from Chicago, and at that time, 68, well, I, I was still in high school, and then around that time, I went into the military, and I really didn't remember the show. Now, the show came on mostly in New York on the East Coast, or what, when it came <laughs> on from 68 to 1972? Yeah, from 1968, which was a really tumultuous year, in yes. response, of course, to the assassination of Martin Luther King, and all the uprisings, I like to call them uprisings, not riots, but the uprising and pushback against the culture happened in 1968. And so it was born at a very crucial time when we, on the heels of the civil rights movement, and we were just trying to establish ourselves. And Ellis Hazlip said, there's so much more than what you see on TV. What do we see on TV? We see riots, we see poverty, we see garbage not picking, not being picked up in Harlem, but there's so much more to black culture that just hadn't been seen on television. There's artists and musicians and, and people pushing back. There's Black Panthers and there's activists and it's a complex uh, fabric that African-Americans make up. And so he knew that he wanted to change the perception of African-American culture on television and by putting it on television, that was really important. And, and well, one of the reasons yeah. also that he wanted to change that perception because uh, President Johnson at that time did, a, uh, I think it was a, a, a colonel report. They had a commission to say, well, why were there, as they call them, riots, but we don't call them that. But right. they, they blamed uh, the media for the riots because they felt that uh, white people uh, saw us in a negative way and also uh, that commission said, hey, well, black people are doing this because of the media. Exactly. And so there was so much to, to sort of, we had to reimagine ourselves on this American landscape. And the, everything was shifting. The political landscape was shifting. But what had never happened until that point, which is hard to imagine now because of social media and all the tons of streaming channels and regular channels, but this idea that Black people hadn't really been shown on television in a truthful way, right. in a way that represented us, in a way that was by us, for us. And so that honest depiction coming right into your living room, that was revolutionary. And to take yes. these artists who had, maybe you had heard them or you had you know, been lucky enough to see them at the Apollo or on the Chitlin circuit, you know, because of Jim Crow, there was no place for people to perform. So to see these artists and these icons on television, that was a game changer. It sure was because I remember as a young man, as a young kid, I think, uh, I waited up late at night to see the Temptations on the Johnny Carson show. But because at the time they were not featured on TV a lot. But then uh, your uncle, he brings this show on and everybody's on that show. And you also started off with the great Al Green for the beginning of this film. I thought it was really important to anchor the beginning of this film with someone who represents true R&B soul music and is the soundtrack of our lives from that era, but also to show him in his, in the very beginning, this was his first time on television before Soul Train and before he had become this sort of icon of the culture. And so I wanted to sort of interrupt, first to show what the television landscape was like, which was right. pretty much one color. Of course. And then to, to, just so people could understand 
how so interrupted that narrative and what was seen and this idea of bringing diversity to television in a way that was unapologetic and uncensored and genuine, you know, in a way that hadn't happened before. So you were having black intellectuals talking about oh, literature, but you might also be having like the, the most famous dentist of the neighborhood talking about, about dental hygiene and, and how to floss your teeth. That's just as important, you know, to, and then showing everybody in the audience represented that this show was for you, for everyone to take part in. And that kind, that level of black love and black care and black sister and brotherhood brought black pride to television. Oh yeah. And when you see it now, it's kind of, it kind of shocks you when you see the, the last poets on there doing their thing. And this idea of poetry as an expression of, of black life that's really remarkable. And so I thought it would be great to show this film now because we are in the same sense as 1968, we're going through our own sort of this eve of racial reckoning that we're on, this great reckoning that is about to happen, or that is happening and changing. And I thought, wow, there's so many parallels between the movements that Ellis Hazlip was involved in and what's happening right. now, whether it's Black Lives Matter and, you know, pushing the culture forward. And I thought, this is what we need because it's not only is it entertaining, but it's inspiring. And it shows us we've always been excellent. You know, Black excellence right. is not a new hashtag. Oh, it's it's not. Me, but the truth is that we've always had this beautiful sense of pride and ownership yeah. and artistry. And so when you see it all in the film, it's, it really is, um, it's very moving. You know, also in the film too, it shows that uh, Ellis was not the first host. First, uh, yeah. we had Dr. Alvin Poussaint. Uh, he was one of the hosts and had another guy, but then reluctantly he decided to host the show. How did he feel about that at first when he started? I'm gonna tell you why that's so significant is because Remember, since there hadn't been any black sort of Tonight Show or any type of format that was like that on television, everyone felt like, oh, it had to be super academic and, and validated and everyone had to be buttoned up in their suit and tie right, because right. how else are you going to prove that we deserve to be here, that we deserve, right. that we're just as good and that we, we have issues that need to be addressed on television and discussed. And so the concern was, well, we must, we have to get some serious intellectual to come in and anchor the show. And just like there had been those, uh, you know, those tests and um, remember the tests about what was beautiful and what wasn't to black children and how they were. Oh yeah, and the dolls and things like black that. Doll. So there were all these ways of approaching black culture that were somewhat academic. So they started out with you know, a Harvard professor mm. who's actually a psychiatrist, Alvin Poussaint. Now we know Alvin because Dr. Poussaint, because he later went on to be sort of the arbiter of black culture. And he was on the Cosby show for many years as the, um, as the consultant yes. of that show. And, and he's really a big part of our culture. He's still at Harvard Medical School. Oh but, yeah? Yeah, we actually interviewed him there on, on camera. But the idea was, well, how do we enter this formal space and still be ourselves? And so Ellis thought, well, I have to have the show validated with this sort of intellectual spine. And then he realized, you know, that wasn't the energy on the street. That wasn't the way artists like to get down. That's not like who we are. And he couldn't figure out how to get the right temperament. And he was a fish out of water because he was a producer, but he was not an on-camera personality. And slowly, after you know, trying to find the right host, he realized, and he, we did have a co-host, Dr. Loretta Long, yes, yes. who went on to, who left the show because uh, Ellis encouraged her to have an audition for a little show called Sesame Street. And so she went on to be Susan on Sesame Street. Oh and yeah, I the rest know. of her career for fifty years she's been. On. And so thank God Ellis, you know, encouraged her. Oh, go to that audition. Maybe it's going to be better for you because he was always thinking, what's better for everyone? So okay. there he was without a host, and he said, well, I'm gonna have to do it. And he found his way, And but what was really special is, because he loved artists and he knew them all, 
and he had friendships with them. You see this kind of intimacy in the show with people who are so comfortable just talking to their friend and being on the show that it, there's no flossing, there's no clout chasing, you know, it's just like this genuine black right. experience without any outside lens. It's not a white gaze and it's not validated or justified. It's just, it just is. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think that's what makes it really special. And he found his way and you can, in the film, we kind of show him going from the fish out of water host all the way to being the perfect host and the show kind of improves as he goes along and gets more colorful, more bold. The, um, it goes from being a small show, local show, to a national show across the country. And then he starts getting all the big names, you know, right up to Stevie Wonder and Earth, Wind and & Fire. So it's this natural progression and it has underneath it this, this sort of honest, um, you know, appeal. And well, I know, think it, it's really, really sweet in that way. It is. And now let's go back to his career because I, I see that you also show that he was a theater producer too. And yeah. he was producing uh, black plays starring mm -hmm. Cicely Tyson, James Earl Jones. And then he did James Baldwin's The Amen Corner. That's now, right. Tell us a little bit about that. He was really, it was really uh, part of, you know, he went to Howard University. And he fell in love with the theater there. They have a really rich theater department. Right, uh, right, right. We call the Howard Players, which is still happening. And so he was inspired that way. And when he came to New York and thought, oh, I'll just get a job as a Broadway producer, he kept hitting that racism wall and realized he couldn't get hired to be to do theater in the state. So he found a way to in sort of embed himself in the black underground black theater. Um, world that was really happening and that's when he started figuring out that wait a minute there's this larger world that just doesn't have the same sort of platform and so he started producing shows with Cicely Tyson and being part of this vast network of some of the most famous black actors that we know from Sidney Poitier, James Earl Jones, Roscoe Lee Brown, yes. you know that whole era that became National Black Theater and the, Na the Negro Ensemble Company. And he took that as his, as his base and, and started working in Europe and taking those shows to Europe. And he always dreamed of taking James Baldwin's play to uh, a national audience. So he was the first person to produce the James Baldwin play, The Amen Corner, and that was in 1965. And so he worked with Lloyd Richards, who became very famous, yes. you know, doing uh, all the plays um, at the Yale Rep. Um, and uh, it was really um, a fertile ground. And that's how he got really connected to a lot of the artists that we know very well now. It was easy for him to take them to Europe and do these shows where there wasn't as much racism in Jim Crow because they weren't responding to that the way we were in America. Right. Right, right. Well, speaking of James uh, Baldwin, I want to go back a little bit to Nikki Giovanni, which I've always been a, a big uh, fan of hers, and yeah. you interviewed her, but there was a great interview between her and James Baldwin that they shot in England. I, I was really amazed at it, because again, I never heard of it, and I never saw it, but to me, that's very historical, that oh. he put that together. It is incredible. And that, that really is the highlight of our film. And in so many ways, it's the high watermark of the series itself. It was very ambitious. So back in the early part of the, of the show, I guess it was the first season. Yeah. Um, he had invited, you know, he had become good friends, very close friends with James Baldwin after doing the tour, the European tour of the Amen Corner. So they already had a relationship. They were good friends. They were pen pals and they were co-conspirators and you know moving the culture forward right. and so he invited him to be on the show the first time and that was in 1969 and in, in between 69 and 70. after that james baldwin became somewhat of a um was in exile because he was so frustrated with the climate of america and mm -hmm. he wrote some of his greatest works outside of america in istanbul and also in france and he was living in St. Paul de Vence. And so when Ellis, who was working closely with Nikki Giovanni, as she was like his muse in a way and a co-host on the show, 
he asked her what she wanted to do. And she said, that's easy. I want to talk to Jimmy Baldwin. And at that time, <laughs> she was 25, Baldwin's 45. And so it was like, you know, meeting her idol. And he said, oh, I can make that happen. But there's one problem is that he's not in the United States. And so Ella said, well, can we meet you halfway somewhere? And, they, and he said, how about London? So now that sounds like an easy thing to do, but think about this, it's 1971. We don't have social media, we don't have cell phones. Taking a crew to London to shoot this iconic interview with a British crew, that was pretty ambitious. And what resulted is this beautiful conversation that's two hours long and they split it up into two episodes. And I'm telling you, they talk about everything. Yeah. Um, black love, black family, the dynamic between black men and women, raising children, you know, respect for each other. It really covers the gamut. And I'll tell you what's so interesting is like last year, uh, there's a very a wonderful uh, artist, comedian, intellect, brilliant performer, Amanda Seals. Uh -huh. who you might remember she's on Insecure and she has a right. podcast and, and she's just doing such great work. Amanda Seals posted a clip from that interview. I think she may have found it. Oh, yeah? And she, it went viral on her Instagram. There were 435,000 posts and likes and comments. And people were responding to it like it had just happened. They weren't going, oh, that's some cool vintage, you know, <laughs> old school archive gem. They were like, no, what she's saying is on point. You know, why do I have to get the worst of you and you've been smiling all day at work? You know, that's real. Yeah. That's real. Talk. And it went so viral that everyone started reposting it. My phone started blowing up. <laughs> and I'm like, what's happening? And I'm like, your, your clip, it's, it's, it's on, you know, it's, it's viral. And I just got so excited about that because it made me realize that the themes that, that happened in this show and the people who were on this show are so iconic that it still speaks to us today. And the fact yes. that Essence retweeted it and Lena Waithe reposted it and For Harriet, all these you know, really popular pages of our social networks started reposting it. And it opened up this conversation and I was just, I was kept saying, hey, over here, it's from the soul show. <laughs> <You know? laughs> also, what I, I also enjoyed uh, Sonia Sanchez. Yeah. Her, her comments and also her involvement with the show at the time too. This uh, is and, uh, important because, you know, one that's of the- very important. One of the, the stories we're telling, which also hasn't been told, is this, the birth of the black arts movement. Surprisingly, nobody has done a comprehensive exploration of the Black arts movement, which was critical, you know, and in, especially for the expansion of Black culture and, and poetry and art that was saying we are not defined by European art. You know, we want an art that represents our people, that, that speaks to us as a nation of people. And so Mary Baraka, you know, if you look at the Black arts movement, it pretty much you think of a Mary Baraka would be like the opening chapter and, right. and, and Sonia Sanchez would be the closing chapter. But the, luckily the book is not done. You know, we're still creating and everything. Oh, that's so great. We wanted her to tell that story. She was also on the show as a poet. And um, we wanted her to lead us through that sort of awakening. And Ellis was also responding to the, the women's movement but instead he was putting black women on the stage. Yes. Putting them forward. No other show was doing that. Not they, at all. They weren't feeling the sisters at that time. <laughs> you know, nope. so this idea that black women could have a platform that was not only a vehicle for African-American artistry, but a, a, a platform for political expression and the fight for social justice. And so to have women have that kind of freedom and putting them out in front, letting them host and letting them celebrate their blackness, that was revolutionary. Well, you know, also the big difference uh, about the, the Soul Show too is that the performers, they were all live. 
And they and you did show that comparison to other TV shows at that time, like Soul Train, American Bandstand. They wear their lip sync. And how did Ellis feel about that? I think he wanted that kind of dynamic feeling, and he wanted the uh, performers. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was so special, and he wanted the performers to be interacting with the audience, not just the audience at home watching on TV but the actual audience in the studio, they became part of the show. They, they were responding because it was for them. And so it was almost like it was this club, he called the club soul. <laughs> and he would set up this experience for everyone in the room to have that just happened to be broadcast into the homes of the nation. And so that was a really incredible thing. And you would have to have a live performance that way he also did something unusual, which is he would let artists have an entire hour. So really? you know, if they come on to like The Tonight Show or Jimmy Fallon or something, they'll do one song. Maybe you're your lead. Your lead. Maybe you're going to plug your album and he'll hold it up for you. But this idea of artists having a whole bunch of songs and having a lot to say and being able to speak, that was different. He actually had Curtis Mayfield host two shows. So Curtis oh, Mayfield did. got to speak and talk about what was important to him and interview other artists. And so he was always giving voice, like literally and figuratively, but mostly literally to artists. And so when Ashford and Simpson had a show, they had a full hour, no commercials. Earth, Wind & Fire had a show. They'd never been on television before. Yeah. They just went to town. Stevie Wonder and Wonder Love had a show. All Stevie Wonder, you know, and so, this idea that you get to experience the artist. And so when Baraka was on there, he called it Baraka the artist. <laughs> he let Baraka do a whole bunch right. of poems and then he would interview him to talk about, you know, what was going down in the community. That well, was unfortunately really though, uh, I'm going ahead a little bit. Yeah. Richard Nixon came into office and and there that we racist are. dude said, well, you know what? Let's cut the funding on that because we don't need that anymore. How did well, Ellis feel about that? No, not only just Ellis, other people uh, who was involved with the show and also the, I think it was the public station too. Yeah. And you know, that mirrors, when you look at the relationship that Nixon had to public media and the media at large, it was not favorable. And there are so many, I'm sure you picked up on this, so many similarities to what's happening in our administration now. Yes. Uh, I won't name any names because we want to keep- I will. Positive. Agent Orange. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's fair. That's what Spike Lee calls him. <laughs> right, so it's just, you know, it's so interesting to see the parallels there because what Seoul was doing was changing minds. And yes. It, and, and changing minds about black folks, right? And we needed that, we demanded that on the heels of the civil rights and Jim Crow. We were saying, no, this is not who we are. This is not the definition of black folks, you know? And so that sort of freedom to speak openly and not be defined by that white gaze, that ruffled a lot of feathers. Because remember, this was public television. So there was no, ads and no no commercials paying for this it was coming from funding from the corporation for public broadcasting which comes from you know national funding yeah. which comes from and comes from and comes from mm -hmm. and so every story has a villain and we ellis felt very positively that it was that people were pushing back against having two black shows you know tony brown had a show called Tony Brown's Journal. I remember that so show. At the time, it was called Black Journal. And so it was Black Journal and it was sold. We had two Black shows, pretty much. Well, and so this it. idea that that was too much. And we, you know, I won't give any spoilers, but we knew that whoever wanted to cancel the show had a larger agenda. And Ellis knew that too. But he also knew that they had done a tremendous amount in five years and that one day it would be appreciated. And I feel like that day is today. It sure is. Well, Melissa, I, I can talk to you for a couple more hours. Okay, come on, let's go. I would love to. <laughs>
But uh, this uh, this movie comes out what, on August 28th, and what's the platform? Is it going to be in theaters or is it going to be on video on demand? Well, what we decided to do was bring this to the people because, you know, we really need uplifting and inspiring stories for the people, by the people. This film is completely independent. And so what we decided to do was bring it, you know, people haven't been able to get out of their homes. People have been suffering. There's been a lot of... Oh tragedy right now i want to acknowledge those who have fallen and those who have supported us in the medical community i got a shout out to medical community yes this has been a very serious time and you know i'm taking that very seriously and so we wanted to give hope we wanted to you know just like we're voting for hope now instead of voting for hate we wanted to give hope back to the community and show this film in a way that people could experience it and remember their love for black culture so it's being released virtually. Um, and so there are cinemas all around the country that even though they're closed, you can't go there, they are showing films on their websites or, you know, so that you can still log oh, okay. on. So what we're doing is we're partnering with all these cinemas and then you can just log on to our website. It's really super easy. And you can pick whatever theater is near you that you like to support, maybe your local theater um, and so, and then you click on that through our website and it's really easy and you get to watch the film. And that way you're supporting your local cinema, but you're also supporting black independent film, which is a great feeling to be able to do that. Sure. And your website so really, is, uh, is it Mr. Soul? Mr. Soul movie.com. Okay, great. So people can go to it. Yeah. And it's going to be uh, live starting August 28th, just like okay. a week from now. Yeah, I know. Right. Whoa. And I'm going to push as much as I can, too, to all my uh, people who watches my my platforms and send it out to other people, too, who have other oh, platforms. Thank you. Yeah, and check out the trailer, too, because the trailer really shows you what the film is about. Yeah. And it's a beautiful expression of Black love, Black music, Black culture. You know, it's really a love letter to Black culture. Well, Melissa, thank you for taking time with me, Al McGee, at Your Entertainment Ticket. And uh, you did a wonderful, beautiful job and a very impressive work with Mr. Soul. I, I'm going to watch it again. I watched it twice already. Oh, so wow. I'm going to watch it again. And uh, man, it well, brought gotta, tears gotta, and smiles to my eyes. Oh, thank you. You got to tell me what your favorite part is next time we talk. Okay. Uh, I'll do that. We'll talk again. All right. And thank you so much. Don't forget, you can hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Mr. Soul the Movie. And then you can just log on to MrSoulMovie.com and check out the film August 28th. Yeah. Oh, just one more thing. Uh, I see that you worked with, uh, uh, she's one, I'm a member of the AAFCA, African American ah, Film Festival. And I see okay. that you work, uh, Chance is one of the producers. And I, I met her because I'm a member. Not only that, I'm from Chicago too. I met her years ago, but we, weren't, we didn't really talk that much. But I see that she worked on the film too. That's wonderful. She is great and she really supports independent cinema. And, you know, we're just so grateful to have Chaz on board. She's one of our executive producers along with Blair Underwood. So we have a yeah. team of people that really just love the film and love what we're trying to do. Well, again, thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. And I'll make sure that uh, people get a chance to go to the website to see this wonderful, impressive film. Thank, thank you, you, Melissa. So and shout out to AFCA, African American Film Critics Association, Gil Robertson. Love oh. you, Gil. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.